So Games Workshop just rebalanced the game of 40k in quite a major way. Big nerfs for the Abmech and Drakari. Lehman Ross is getting 2 plus armor saves. Chaos getting a nice all faction melee boost. And Knights might actually be able to claim some objectives. Necron's got a boost. Orc Boggy's got a nerf. And much more besides. Let's take a look. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're talking about the new Warhammer big FAQ that's come out, the change that they're calling their new balanced data slate, aimed to try and give every faction a bit more of a fighting chance against every other. To be honest, for me this really couldn't come soon enough, the higher end of competitive 40k has got really stale over the last few months, a lot of events being cleaned up by Drakari and Abmech, and some armies almost laughably below even the ones that are the next tier down. I wasn't the biggest fan of Games Workshop's last chapter approved because they really didn't change all that much, and it seems they've pivoted back away from that in quite spectacular style. So apparently this new balance pass is the first of many. It's a new initiative by Games Workshop called the 40k balance data slate, and apparently they'll be doing this each quarter, changing a few rules for certain armies to hopefully rein in the best ones and buff the weakest. I do wonder if that recent 40k survey might have been feedback to try and help future editions of this. What's more, they do seem quite happy to make some fairly radical changes to armies. I don't think this is necessarily going to please everyone, but I must admit, I personally like it a lot. I think it's great news for the game of 40k as a whole. The update is aimed at match play 40k. I think unless you're playing very narrative or casual games, I think generally people will want to be using these rules. They'll certainly be used at the vast majority of tournaments and events, the games workshops and independent ones, and I think that will give them an air of legitimacy. They do say in their article though, if you don't want to use these in your home games at home, then of course you're under no obligation to, if yourself and your opponent are in agreement. I quite like the style, it's really quite a fairly compact and punchy document, only a few small rules changes, not a massive amount of changes to all sorts of things, and it does give other factions a bit of hope that things might improve for them, even before they get their next codex, or the next version of chapter approved with the big points update. The content of this one kind of boils down to four major changes. First up, and really quite a big shake up, is that you can't take any more than two flyers in 2000 point match play games. I think that one certainly has the potential to cause ripples. There's been some individual rules buffs for Necrons, Imperial Guard, Imperial and Chaos Knights, and Chaos Space Marines. A fairly hefty nerf to the worst excesses of Orc Boggy spam. And then an entire reprinted point section for Drakari and Admech. Nerfs on really quite a lot of their most competitive units. There were a couple of buffs for their less played stuff. All of these are pretty major changes for the armies involved, so let's go through them one by one. First up, and the only general rule for all of 40k in this, is a universal match play rule that's basically even more draconian than the rule of three, and it just really stops you spamming flyers. The rule says that if you're playing incursion or combat patrol, you can't take more than one aircraft. If you're playing strike force, then you can't take more than two. And if you're playing onslaught, you can't take more than three. The reason for this rule is to try and curb some problematic flyer spam lists that have been going around. Really there's only two main armies that are the culprit of this, the Admech with their Stratoraptors and Fusilarves, and the dreaded Orc Freebooter list with Max Dacker Jets and maybe a few Wasbomb Blaster Jets. The problem with flyers in 40k is that they have just such ridiculous movement that they're almost always going to be able to get line of sight on key things. It's not really such a big deal when flyers are fairly weak and people don't take very many of them. But when a flyer gets strong, it sort of has a bit of a tipping point, where maybe if you just have one or two of the flyers on the board, it's not really that big a deal. But if you suddenly get people spamming something like six flyers and zooming over to the other side of the board, you might be able to deal an alpha strike that's so punishing that the opponent really has no way to recover from it, and they can't even hide their units from the onslaught. That was the issue that we were mainly seeing with the Stratoraptors and the Dacker Jets. If you go second, then you're likely to have a huge chunk of your army blown away. Limiting flyers to just two planes in most competitive games really will fix that. I still think that Stratoraptors, Fuselarves and Dacker Jets will have a decent utility role, but you won't see as many people spamming three different patrols to get a whole bunch of different flyers, and it really kills flyer spam as a way that you can play 40k. I think for the most part, most armies aren't really going to feel this too much unless they were really going heavy on them. I'd say maybe the one real unintended consequence of this that's going to take collateral damage are the Imperial Guard Valkyrie Air Cavalry lists. It's really quite a fun and fluffy way to play guard, they're certainly not going to be too strong at the moment, and this is very much an unintended consequence of the flyer ban. I can imagine that there's going to be at least a fair few guard players out there who are not going to be too happy to have their army just basically declared illegal. I'd hope that whenever they make the Imperial Guard Codex they might address this, 
Or maybe they might even put an exception to the rule in the next balance data sheet and maybe allow that build a free pass. It just seems a shame to catch a very fluffy and non-competitive build in the crosshairs when you're trying to fix one specific problem in the game. I kind of wonder whether a better fix might just have been just to say one flyer per detachment and that's it. That could have allowed you up to three in strike force and still let Valkyries have their squadrons. Still though, for the competitive game, this is really quite a big change and a nerf to some of the worst lists out there that had little interactivity, so I think it's certainly a decent change for tournament play. Talking of the guard though, it really isn't all that bad news. If you're an armour commander, then your Lehman Rosses now have a 2 plus armour save, so they won't be bursting into the enemy anti-tank weapons quite as easily as before. It's kind of interesting that Guard get a boost to one of their stronger units, as this will affect tank commanders as they have the Lehman Ross keyword, but it might well be strong enough to encourage people to run a few more regular Rosses as well. Having one with a demolisher cannon charge down the middle of the table seems like a really durable distraction Karn effects now. It means that anything that gives you plus one save, like the Astropath Psychic Barrier, that will now be extra valuable. I can certainly see that being a popular one to protect a key tank commander or Pask, it means that AP3 things will now still get a 4 plus save against them. A nice change, as one of the weaker armies in 9th, Guard really needed a boost like this. The only thing I would say is that it might have been nice to allow Baneblades to have this as well. They're in a similar, if not worse, place to standard Rosses, so a 2 plus armor save might have been handy. That's not all though, as there's a couple of buffs for orders. First up, tank orders have been changed, so they now are applicable to any regiment vehicle, not just standard Rosses, though I'm afraid you still can't order super heavies. Still, tank commanders only get one order per tank, and I think it will usually be best ordering themselves. Getting b-roll ones to hit or smoke launchers on a really expensive tank is usually going to be the best way to go. But I guess, say, first turn if they don't have line of sight, you could put that b-roll ones to hit on a full payload manticore or something. That might well be the best way to go in some situations. Finally, infantry orders can go twice as far for a lot of the more common ones. Basically now, each time an infantry officer issues an order to some infantry, if it's one of the orders that's listed here, then you can have that apply to another infantry squad that's within 6 inches as well. So now your shouty officer can now shout at two different guard squads next to each other, and it only takes one order to do so. Quite a few of them are relevant, get back in the fight to shoot after you've fallen back, first rank fire, second rank fire to double up your last shots, and fixed bayonets could potentially have really quite a lot of guardsmen fighting in the shooting phase. Notably, it's not move, 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 and to be honest, I can kind of see why. Having guardsmen running around at the speed of jet bikes already is a little bit ludicrous. I can see why Games Workshop might not want to double that up. Still though, it's a small but meaningful buff. We'll make foot guard a little bit better, though I'm not sure it's going to change how people build lists massively. Out of this, I'd definitely say that the 2 plus Lehman Ross armor save is the best thing. I'm sure we'll see a few more of those hitting the table. Next up, we have a really powerful boost to Imperial Knights. And in terms of the buffs making armies more competitive out of this FAQ, I'd say this might be one of the best. Basically, this change is going to make both Imperial and Chaos Knights far, far better at taking objectives, something they've generally struggled with being single model walkers with no obsec. First up, for the big guys, the Titanic Knights, they now count as a whopping 10 models when they're controlling objectives, which means that unless the enemy has obsec, you're almost always going to be controlling it above them, unless they've managed to amass really quite a decent horde on said objective. There's going to be a lot less of units just sweeping in to steal objectives from under their noses. You'll generally actually have to bring the knight down if you want to take the objective that he's standing on. It gets way better though for armagers and war dogs. Not only do they count as five models for taking objectives now, but they also get obsec themselves. They are very much becoming the troops of the Imperial Knights. Having obsec and being counted as a small squad like this is really powerful for walkers this fast. These guys move an incredible 14 inches so could easily zoom up the board and then charge the enemy, or just blaze away at close range with some auto cannons or lightning locks perhaps. I think they're already at least reasonably efficient units, this is going to get them taken even more. Overall, it's just a really nice boost to night players and tournament play. A few people were already having some success with them, but for winning games, this is going to be a massive deal. Next up, for Chaos Space Marines, they have got an army-wide change, and no, it isn't the extra wound on their standard Space Marines. What's happened though is a power tweak to the Death to the False Emperor, where it's now far better than it was before. Previously, this would be the rule where the Chaos Space Marines would get extra attacks on a 6 whenever they're fighting against Imperial forces. It's a pretty handy melee boost, it'd usually be worth an extra 16% damage increase on what they'd have normally. Now though, it now works on every single faction, so you don't need to worry if you're fighting Imperium, Drakari, or other Chaos. 
though I must admit it does make their name a bit of a misnomer. Presumably, they're still very angry at the Emperor, still while they're fighting Tau. In any case, though, they get it all the time, and every time that you do roll a 6 to hit, it just causes an extra hit. For standard Chaos Marines that are hitting on 3s, that's usually going to equate to a 25% melee boost. Far better than they would have had before against Imperium, and far, far better against anything that they wouldn't have triggered it against. It's going to be very relevant for any of their fighty characters, and particularly things like Lightning Claw Terminators, or maybe Possessed Bombs with Word Bearers, or the World Eaters Corn Berserkers. It's genuinely a nice little buff to make Chaos a little bit stronger and more fun in game, though I must admit I'm not sure it's going to solve their army's problems as a whole, they're still fairly fragile when they get shot, and they still will very much want their extra wounds. I do like the change though, it's a nice power boost to an army that needed it. Next up we have the buff to the Undying Forces of the Necrons, and that's the rollout of the core keyword onto a large section of all their army. When their codex came out, they were kind of conspicuous next to the Space Marine decks. Space Marines got core on almost every single infantry unit, besides a couple of things like Centurions, whereas Necrons only got it on four units throughout their codex. I think the fluff was that the Destroyers and the Flayed Ones were just a bit too mad to command properly, and the Canoptic units were seen as more tools of war rather than squads to command. It did mean though that quite a lot of their HQs and buffing abilities were fairly limited in scope, and it did seem a shame when you have things like destroyers marching up towards the enemy alongside Necron characters, you couldn't give any sort of command abilities to them. That really has changed though, as a whole bunch of units have suddenly gained core. The Canoptic Reanimator, Canoptic Wraiths, Flayed Ones, Locust Destroyers and Heavy Destroyers, Scorpec Destroyers and Aphidian Destroyers, Triarch Praetorians, and Canoptic Acanthrites from the Forge World Compendium. We might have to do a follow-up video in a day or two to talk through this, I kind of feel like the entire Necron Codex needs to have another look at it now, with what things can work with what, but in general it's very good news for the faction as a whole. I think Technomancers will become a lot more relevant. Now, say, if you've got an injured Locust Heavy Destroyer squad, you could be setting up a 60-point model every turn. Rites of Reanimation goes a lot further on these big meaty models. Even just having more flexible things like My Will Be Done for hitting on twos with Scorpec Destroyers or Locust Destroyers, those will both be very nice indeed. And Flayed Ones seem like another very interesting unit that can receive a whole ton of buffs, now far less limited than they were before. It's not all good news to every single army though, and now we're starting to get into some nerfs. As I talked about in a previous video the other week, Orc Speed Wildlists have been having an enormous amount of success recently, often with devastating Alpha Strikes that can take out a chunk of the enemy army even if they're well hidden. Games Workshop have decided that they don't want people spamming their new buggies too much though, and their buggy spam option just got nerfed very hard indeed. Now, rather than just having the rule of three affecting these buggies, you can now only take one unit of each of the October buggies. So say one unit of Rocket Truck Squig buggies, and one unit of Megatrack Scrap Jets. The only one not affected is the Death Killer War Trike, who's an HQ and already has his own restrictions. You can still take up to three of each buggy, as you can take three in a unit, but to be honest, squad running them isn't always the best idea. It does make them a bit less flexible. It means that in total you can only have up to a maximum of 15 of the buggies, and they've all got to be three of the different ones, and no one's able to spam something like nine scrap jets or nine rocket trucks. I still think that taking three of the rocket truck squig buggies will almost be an auto-include in most orc lists, but at least that feels a little bit more in proportion with the rest of the list, and not just spamming endless orky food trucks to fight the enemy with. This one is certainly a major nerf to one of the strongest orc builds, between this and limited flyers, you're going to have to look at data sheets and things that you didn't have to before in the codex, as you were already kind of done after spamming three Dacker Jets and all the best buggies. I must admit, as a fix, it does seem a little bit heavy-handed to me. I'm sure there'll be a few people at home who are pretty annoyed at having bought more than three of any one buggy, and even if you've just got two or three of them, being forced to put them in a squadron could be a little bit annoying. It certainly makes them a lot more of a peripheral unit in the Orc Codex, rather than one that you can build the core of your army around, though I must admit it does have some positives, if new players look into an orc army and see that the best list is going to require them to build 9 identical buggies, then that's going to be a pretty big killer for motivation. Overall, I find it hard to argue with a nerf to one of the strongest builds in the game to let other things shine through, though I do find it a bit interesting that they decided to do this with datasheet restrictions as opposed to with points changes. Perhaps if the buggies were just pointed a bit more fairly, it wouldn't be that big a deal in the first place. Next though, we come to the Admech, and Games Workshop really has done a number on these. I'd argue it's one of the most brutal batteries of nerfs that we've seen in 40k since 8th edition started. Almost every single competitive unit in the Admech decks has gone up by a very decent amount, 
at least 10% extra in points cost and in some cases more. Admech basically have been winning every second tournament, so I can see why Games Workshop wants to bring them back in line. Though the response is maybe a little bit more punchy than normal, where they often just tweak a few data sheets and then wait for a bit to see whether or not that's had enough effect. In the HQ section, they've had some small nerfs to the Tech Priest Manipulus and Skitari Marshal, by far the most competitive and played HQs. Sorry, that bit about the Dominus is just an error, he was 75 points before. The Manipulus is the go-to one for buffing Rangers and Vanguard, getting extra AP and range is great, and the Skitari Marshal is basically still one of the most efficient buff characters in the game, even with this. With his own innate rerolls and the relic he can carry, he'll still be a massive buff centerpiece. Otherwise, the Artisan's Holy Order and the Logi Holy Order have both gone up a bit. Artisan's is the fall back and shoot one, and can potentially change around for a plus one to strength if you want it, and Logi is the one that allows you to ignore AP-1 and AP-2. It's a really key part of the layered buffs that make the Skitari Rangers and Vanguard really hard to shift, and I'm not too surprised to see it nerfed a bit. Moving on to the units, and Rangers and Vanguard are both up a point to nine points each. Not really too hard to see why they've gone up. They've got about a million shooting buffs, and already, just on their base stats, they were arguably some of the best shooting of any troop's choice in 40k. Not only that, but their Omnispecs and Data Tether have both gone up too. They're both 10 points each, rather than 5 points each. That's the ignore cover, and the bit to transmit orders all over the board. Infiltrators and Rust Stalkers, the Sicarian units, were both being spammed en masse. They're up 2 points each now, to 19 points per model. I think that is going to be quite a big deal for how often they're played now. I think that the Fulgurite and Corpus Gari priests might get considered a lot more as an alternative, and maybe infiltrators might be toned down a bit, maybe people using them more for just a few squads to have in the midfield, as opposed to having three max-sized units. Cerberus Raiders caught arguably the very biggest nerf out of anything though. They've gone up from 16 points to 20, a 4-point nerf, but that basically means they're a massive 25% more expensive than they were before, which is a huge decrease to their efficiency as a unit. They now cost just as much as their Sulphur Hounds, the ones with the heavy hitting Flamers, and I kind of wonder whether a few people might start to experiment with the Sulphur Hounds as an alternative. Despite the Flyer nerf, two of the planes have also gone up 20 points as well. The Strata Raptor is now 180 base, and the Fuselave is 150. They're now quite comfortably less firepower than their ground based equivalents, and they do pay a bit more of a premium for their mobility. Iron Striders have gone up 10 points to 75 points base, so 85 for the last cannon variant. After losing core, these are now looking far more in line with the other firepower in the codex, and it's going to be a bit more of a debate whether you take these compared with things like Onagers or Scorpius Disintegrators. Finally, to throw Admech players just one small bone, their Castellan robots have gone down 10 points, they're down to 90 points from 100, and I would argue that they were one of the units that most needed a buff in the codex, they just seem very expensive for what you got before. They might be in genuine contention for being taken now, they are going down when really quite a lot of the strongest choices are going up. Generally though, this is a really massive raft of nerfs, Admech are certainly going to get a lot weaker as a result, and I'm genuinely interested to see where they'll be after the dust settles, what sort of armies people will be taking, and whether or not they'll still be winning tournaments. I think the changes might be quite good for the internal balance of the codex to be honest, other units are going to get more consideration now. I guess maybe one of the strongest picks that didn't get nerfed might be the Taraxi Sterilizers, I'm sure they'll see a fair bit of play. In any case, it might not be the worst for Admech players overall. Hopefully you won't need to feel quite so bad about bringing them out as a faction in a casual game anymore, though I still think that they have the capacity to be very strong indeed, with all their massive overlapping buffs and synergies. Finally, we come to the Drakari, and compared with the Admech, the buffs and nerves are much more of a mixed bag, though I think it will still weaken the faction as a whole, as the nerves have all fallen on things that tended to be played quite a lot, and a lot of the buffs were given to things that don't see competitive play as much. The biggest single nerf out of this entire update though was felt by the Succubus, going up a huge 20 points to 80 points, and now perhaps a bit more reflective of the massive amount of melee rage that they can unleash. I'd argue that it's maybe not the Succubus's main data sheet that's actually the problem, it's the crazy relics and warlord traits that they can get that turn them into a blender character. I still think that they'll certainly get taken in Drakari lists, but now just a little bit less attractive than before, and for every one that you take, there'll be 20 points less of other units on the board. Next up, we've got a 5 point nerf to the Archon, up to 70 points. Again, a really solid character, particularly with certain relics. I'm sure he'll still be played with his Gym Blade, but again, a small increase. The Homunculus has gone down 10 to 70, making them a bit more of a credible choice for leaving Covens. They really weren't seeing quite as much play as the other HQs. Drizar was often taking the place of a Homunculus in any Coven patrols. 
for the troops and units, there's two really quite major nerfs, which is up a big 2 points to 12 points each, and these fast moving murder machines are now 12 points per model, far more of a luxury pick compared with what they were. That one's really going to hurt, and I think that we'll see far less of them as a result. Incubi, another one of Drakari's very best units, have also gone up 2 points to 18 from 16. Our unit's going to cost you 90 points rather than 80. It's not the end of the world, and they'll still be able to trade up against a whole ton of things, but they don't feel quite as undercosted as they used to. Otherwise, on the nurse front, raiders have now got a bit more expensive with Dark Lancers. They still cost 95 points base, as they did after the previous FAQ, but now if you want a Dark Lancer long, you have to pay an additional 10 points over that. It means that a raider with a Dark Lance is now 105 points, and one with a Disintegrator is 100. I kind of wonder if that might have been a very slight over-nerf to them. I feel like that might actually get to the point where people are bringing Venoms over raiders, and either way, it certainly hurts Drakari as a whole. Finally for nerfs is the Kronos Parasite engine. It's up 5 points to 75. A bit of a sturdy little brick of a pain engine, this one. Can still be very potent with Dark Technomancers, and people could spam a fair few of them. Not the biggest change in the world, but a touch less efficient. Finally though, we have a fair few underplayed units getting buffs. Grotesques have gone down a big 5 points to 35. They now feel a bit more in line with the rest of the codex, as opposed to being a bit subpar. The planes have each gone down 10 points as well. Again, that'll allow them to compete better. And the Talos has gone down 10 points to 100 points. I'd say perhaps the most surprising change out of them though, was the Ravager going down to 130 points from 140. I felt like people did run Ravagers at least a bit already, and now this thing is just an incredibly efficient Dark Lance platform. I'm not entirely sure why Raiders have to pay 105 points for one Dark Lance, but Ravagers get 3 for 130 points. I don't know whether they were intending to put a points cost for Dark Lances on the Ravager, but whatever the reason is, Ravagers seem really good now. If you want your Lance Fire, then put it on the Ravagers, and maybe less on Raiders. Overall, I'd certainly say that it's less bad news than it is for the Admech, Plenty of buffs mixed in with the nerfs, but the nerfs really do catch some incredibly important units, and ones that were almost guaranteed to see multiple units played across almost every competitive Drakari list. I don't think it's any bad thing to be honest. Again, like Admech, Drakari felt comfortably above the power level of a lot of the other factions. Hopefully this will right the scales a bit more, and allow other people more of a chance when they play them. So that's it for the main changes for the FAQ, but I think it's quite interesting to note what's unchanged as well. We know that some of the next codexes are going to be Gene Stealer Colts, Custodes and Tau, so none of them got any changes. That's kind of to be expected, really. I'd say perhaps the single competitive build that really seems to have got away with it this time is Grey Knight Dread Knight spam. At least over the past few weeks, Dread Knights and Grey Knight lists seem to have been getting a comfortable amount of tournament wins. Maybe not quite as many as Drakari or Admech, but not so far behind. With their former two rivals heftily nerfed, I sort of feel like Grey Knights might be taking centre stage right now, and might be one of the strongest armies in the game. Otherwise, might be a new opportunity for the Sisters of Battle or Space Marines to break through. They're both very good as well, and I'm surprised that certain marine units didn't get addressed. I think the Relic Contemptor with the dual Volkite weapons, that is going to get nerfed at some point or other. It's only a matter of time. Finally, for armies that have been overlooked, I think the Craft Worlds could have used a bit of a buff here. Along with Guard, Chaos Marines, and Imperial Knights, they're one of the armies that are struggling the most right now and it does seem strange that no effort at all was made to address them. I guess if we're being very optimistic, it really could hint that their codex could be sooner rather than later. If they happen to be the next codex after Tau, I could see why Games Workshop might not want to make any changes at this point. Pure speculation though, we really don't know whether that's true. Otherwise, for mid-tier factions that could have been buffed, Demons do have a few good builds, but lots of bad units as well. I think it wouldn't have hurt to give them something, and Tyranids have just had a bit of an update themselves. Maybe they're waiting to see how their new rules from Octarius with the Leviathan and the Synaptic Links play out before making any further changes. Overall though, for the health of 40k as a whole, this is an absolutely amazing update. It's really doing exactly what they need to do, rein in the good stuff, buff the bad stuff, and hopefully there shall be a lot more chance for armies against each other in the middle. I'm very happy that they've done this, and I think it's going to make people a bit more interested in the competitive scene again, which I did feel had been getting a little bit boring over the last few months. In any case though, let me know what you think down in the comments below. There's absolutely loads to go over here, so if I missed anything, let me know. Some of the points changes might have slipped me by. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspecs Tactics. I'll certainly keep up with any Games Workshop's news or updates, and I have new 40k videos out just about every day. Hopefully I'll do another couple on the subject of this update, maybe going over some certain armies like Garden Necrons. 
Finally, if you'd like to help support the channel and keep all these videos coming, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page, which is down in the video description below. Making all these videos, or being ready to make them at a drop of a hat, takes a fair bit of time and effort, and if you are enjoying all the work, then any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, such as seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.